Gains on the board continuing 160 points higher on the Sensex, uh, on the Nifty and 530 points higher on the Sensex. Uh, the stock that's now in pole position is actually Tata Motors, um, you know, rallying quite smartly for 4.5% four on the upside over here. Uh, Mr. Tulsi, and I mean, when the tide is high, all boats rise. We know that uh, old theory. But is there any point in even looking at this boat, Tata Motors, for the time being? So to be given choice, and when I, you know, which I've said in the morning, also given choice, if I have in the auto space, probably I will say no. One can always say that in three years, four years, five years, but do you have the patience? to see or share, you know, having bought at 170 to see it fall into 150. Because if you, I just compare it with the CV or maybe the PV space, you know, in, in, the, in, the, in the similar comparable play, probably Mahindra and Mahindra, you know, be, be beaten down. Either you go for the evergreen stock like 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 Maruti or you go for with, with Mahindra and Mahindra where you have the comfort on the CV, PV as well as the cons consolidated results, you know, gives, ca captures the benefits of the Mahindra and Mahindra, Tech Mahindra, Mahindra and Mahindra finance kind of things. So my, 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 my focus will rather be or my preference will rather be on, on, on Maruti and Mahindra and Mahindra. And the third stock, if I really wish to add anything other than two-wheeler, then it could be escorts. So I, I won't, I, I'll refrain from taking a call on Tata Motors even at the current level. Okay, fair enough. Uh, uh, in a strong market, Mr. Hussain, the one stock which is down is Sun TV. Uh, numbers for week, of course. Uh, but uh, 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 at 5.30, how, how's the stock looking? Anuj, I won't say that numbers are weak because definitely the margins are seen having contracted, but if you see the absolute PBT and PAT and all sort of things, they are seen to be flat, you know, on a YOI basis as well as on a quarter, quarter, quarter basis. But I think that probably market is not in a mood to because it, the, the, the company belongs to the camp of, of UPA group, you know, DNK, and probably they the they market is fearing that they are not seeing the beneficiary now either you have to see the because once you once you you see the sentiments you know turning positive then you you start taking the the, the market becomes risk taker as well you you you, you avoid your risk covers uh, uh, mentality so yes taking that into consideration given choices available maybe on the theme or maybe the uh, companies and sectors which are going to get rewarded with this government coming in people are not taking a call on on on, on sun tv but if you purely wants to tip, uh, de detach yourself from a DMK Association, then the results and the valuations are looking good for Sun TV at the current level. Okay. Uh, all right, Mr. Tulsi, and we will wrap it up on that note for today. Have a great weekend, and we will see you with the market again next week. Lots of stocks are moving around, by the way. Look at uh, Graphite. Suddenly, there's an 8% surge on some of these really beaten down names. Uh, then there are others like Hoodco. I mean, Hoodco is moving higher. Perhaps, again, the same hope trade on affordable housing, etc. Whatever is really playing out here. Uh, days high on that stock as well. Jubilant Foodworks has suddenly uh, picked up momentum. Days high, 1.5% up on Jubilant Foodworks as well. So plenty of flair in the mid-cap market today. Let's get you uh, some more opinion from market veterans. As India gets ready for Modi 2.0, we get you the biggest and best market voices. Earlier in the day, we caught up with Nilkant Mishra of Credit Suisse and Rhythm Desai of Morgan Stanley. Take a look at how they are viewing the market in the current context. The economic slowdown is not uh, drastic enough uh, to, for, for us to, uh, uh, to expect the government to act. Uh, so, so for what it's worth, some of the staples companies, the largest staples companies are still seeing high single-digit uh, growth. We are seeing petrol demand growing at 9%. So while the slowdown is there, it is not steep enough uh, for the government to, uh, to feel as if there is a necessity for action. Markets do not have any lasting impact of electoral outcomes, uh, and all those arguments I think are well known. Uh, we go back to seeing wherever there is uh, rapid earning growth. So if you do a, a Z score on the banks, most of the banks are trading at very high Z score levels, which is basically that they're trading at very elevated multiples compared to where they were in the last eight, nine years. But they are also going to contribute to nearly 60% of the earnings growth in the, in the Nifty. And uh, the eight banks in the Nifty are together going to generate nearly one trillion rupees of profit this year. Very clearly, yesterday afternoon, the market told us uh, they are done with the elections. And you know, the Nifty reaction in the afternoon really puzzled me. I think uh, the, the economy has gone through this uh, soft spot for the past four or five months which is largely to do with uh, the tightness in liquidity and the problem that the non-banks have faced. 
and to a great extent that liquidity tightness is already ebbing. My bet would be to buy domestic cyclicals. I particularly like the auto stocks as uh, we had discussed on polling day in Mumbai. I think uh, they are pricing in a, in, in a significant slowdown and maybe even negative growth in F20. And I feel that at some point in time in the next two or three months, we should see a discernible turn in, in auto demand. Okay. <clears throat> okay, that was the view that we got from Nilkant and Rhythm Desai. And Jay Kumar, MD of Prime Securities, now joins us on the show. Jake Sai, good afternoon. Thanks a lot for joining us. Uh, uh, in the morning, you had a very interesting tweet going, as you know, as stunning as the election outcome. Perhaps even more potent was the oratory that was on display yesterday. And we have entered a golden period for Indian polity. Uh, translate that for us. For what does it mean for the market as well? Because you know, now I want you to hear, you know, wear your 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 market hat. Okay. Uh... <laughs> Well, uh, thanks for having me over. And uh, for a moment, just stepping away, I think uh, I want to go back to uh, something that many of us might have done in classes, uh, you know, on uh, whether motivational theory or sociology or psychology, for that matter, sociology more importantly. Uh, it's called the Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. Uh, it's a very interesting concept in that the it's a triangular-shaped pyramidal, uh, it's a kind of a pyramid where the base of the pyramid addresses what we call the physiological needs of human beings. And as you go up the, uh, the pyramid, you go to emotional needs, then you go to uh, uh, you know, social needs, love, etc., until you reach the uh, top of the pyramid, which is uh, you know, your self-actualization needs. That is, you become you know, evolved into spirituality, etc. So I call uh, this election, in fact, uh, marking what I would call the Maslow movement, uh, movement for India. And why do I say the Maslow movement? Because what's brought the BJP uh, back with a kind of, a, you know, almost unprecedented uh, in terms of expectations or otherwise numbers is the fact that they addressed or they have been addressing the base of the pyramid. If you take India and its polity uh, and their needs as such over the years, in 2022, we'll be 75 years old after independence. And in that period, we have seen, if nothing else, from, for almost 95% of this period, we have seen a noticeable divergence between uh, the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer, as it were. And all that has happened is at the base of the pyramid is what we call the roti kapada makan, the physiological needs. Translated differently, this government has provided everything from LPG cylinders to light, electricity, uh, to toilets. And what make, you know, and you could say, you know, how is that that relevant? It is, if you see the mass of India living where they do, for most of them, it has been addressing their basic needs. And that, if anything else, has been the telling story that when those kind of things happen, and if you see the manifesto, it goes on to talk about the digital connect, the infrastructural connect, etc. So I think the story of this thing is going to be the improvement of the Indian polity. And as you aim to increase per capita uh, income, the thing that you need to do is to solidify the base. And that's going to continue to get solidified in my opinion, which means that there's going to be greater connect digitally, there's going to be improvement in roads and the connectivity with villages, there's going to be greater job creation as a result, and there's going to be a per capita consumption. So this is not a quick, uh, you know, uh, uh, Formula One kind of a pit stop where you do something to the capital markets and you feel uh, you know, you've improved uh, wealth because a few people in Bombay and Delhi feel uh, uh, richer. So I think this is not about markets. And frankly, if you ask me, I don't believe that for them, the market is just a sideshow, if that, in Delhi. I think they're more concerned, and none of us should be complaining, that after 75 years, you actually have a solid growth of the base, the pyramid gets stronger, and therefore the country gets even stronger. I think that's the... If you superimpose this, I don't think, uh, you know, and where I think Nyai or whatever else got it wrong, apart from not being communicated, is that I don't think the Indian polity needs dole. They don't need handouts. What they need is opportunity. They are willing to put in their uh, hard yards. And I'm not wanting to sound like a politician, nor am I espousing socialism. But the reality is, at the end of the day, populism, red socialism, or whatever you call it, is there across the length and breadth. It's winning more elections than otherwise. So why fix the formula if it ain't broke? So the idea is, I think more needs to continue, not necessarily 
at the expense of the other stuff. So while for people in Bombay, people in Delhi and the financial markets, the NBFC is an issue, funding, credit crunch, consumption. But these, to my mind, come much later. So, why, is the, why is the market uh, celebrating I, that, What I call Jakes. the Maslow moment is... Re why, is why is the market because celebrating it? there is a longer term story that if you... Hmm. It is celebrating simply because it is not negative to markets. All that you are doing is you are actually genuinely enhancing purchasing power by creating long term structural uh, you know, uh, pillars in place. And the reality also is that today, if in the process of doing this, I mean over the last 4-5 years there has been nothing dramatically market oriented. Remember India is still growing at 7% give or take half a percent. Remember that can the people feel it can go into the 8, 9, maybe even to double digits. Mm. A lot of that requires structural reforms. And I think the fact that money has reached where it ought to, the fact that now piped water will reach people, the fact that you know toilets will all have water, etc., etc., are pretty dramatic, you know, infrastructural steps to take. Sure, it will have, to my mind, its repercussions in terms of uh, stocks in the market. Of course, road building, com I mean, uh, road companies, uh, infrastructure companies. I think they will be awash with orders, but. Can they translate that? How leveraged are they? That becomes an individual stock call. So I think this is to my mind, I ha I'm happy as an Indian. I'm not necessarily saying this is great for markets, but long term it will. But uh, you know, we are used to instant gratification. and I don't think uh, that is something that we should necessarily assume will happen with every mandate being as resounding at it, as this one is. Uh, Jake, so I take your longer term point and I guess if this government can go on and do whatever is right for the economy, uh, especially, of course, the rural, rural economy, it'll find its sort of uh, mirror reflection in the market and the hope trade maybe that we're witnessing today. And that's my question, really. This big hope trade, uh, if this continues, what we're seeing today, yesterday was a sell-off, today the hope trade is back. How long do you see the hope trade continuing? And uh, could it flatter to deceive again, specifically when it comes to these infrastructure stocks? Uh, the way I would look at it is today, it's a lot more difficult and only the absolutely able and the well-deserving get credit lines from banks or NBFCs. And I think that ought to be the order of the day. Uh, the consolidation in PSU banks is clearly on us. With that will come greater risk management. Will that, with that will come greater uh, focus on creditworthiness. With that will come greater independence because these will become larger, more responsible organizations and institutions. Similarly, the NBFC space will start getting crunched as more and more, uh, you know, as weaker managements, in a sense, bring in partners either from overseas or, or domestic. So I think if in that context, it's only those who are able to get, you know, have access to credit in the NBFC space who will continue to grow. So if you say infrastructure, if there's a company with limited equity and they want to execute projects, they're not going to be able to do it. So when you say flatter to deceive, it is principally that infrastructure companies other than the top two or three have not been well capitalized. And I think all that is going to change as we go along. So, so the point here I'm making is, I think you're coming into a world where maybe today the NBFC pressure is the one that everybody talks about they, uh, when they are here. And I personally believe, well, that is clearly one of the things that we live and breathe every day. But that's not the end of the world. The, the world outside is a lot more. And I think as an Indian, this kind of a decisive mandate which nobody could predict mm. tells us that there's a lot more ground up happening. I'm saying it's not bad for the markets, mm. but there is no immediate rub off to say the index okay. should be up 15%. The market may react for two reasons. There are few com countries in the world with this kind of growth and this kind of demographics. So money has to come in. That's a no brainer. And I now believe that even the domestic money will start coming yeah. in because there is no option. Okay, that point is well taken. Uh, so, you know, is today a, a bit of a teaser of things to come? Because I know just having this discussion with Surabhi uh, uh, Jakes uh, when, she, the, when the show started, that if today you were to make an index of, uh, say, a cement companies, real estate companies, uh, three or four good infra companies, uh, that index would be up at least six or seven percent today. Sure. Uh, and this is one space where we have seen, of course, uh, uh, right. multiples getting crunched or whatever. So, is this a bit of a teaser for, of things to come over the next six months? Absolutely. I think the answer is right. There needs to be the creation of an all-market index or, a, you know, or indices of, uh, of uh, companies that are not, you know, not widely tracked. And clearly, I think 
the story of the uh, the markets in terms of returns will be you know the neglected the beaten down stocks which have value where balance sheets are not under stress and you know there's this thing which uh, i know rashesh says this and i kind of borrow it from him he says there are no stressed assets in india in general there are only stressed promoters and i think that's the important thing there are enough assets available that are productive that are good entrepreneurship has never been uh, a question mark in india the access to capital in the environment has been an issue if the environment is now provided in terms of you know orders etc people will need to bring in equity so you go back to your point i think the answer lies in what you're saying create an index of companies which have been not in demand not the the 6 8 companies that have uh, governed the index as it were because the all market index is at least 25% lower than the 11700 or 800 that we are at today and i think that therein lies the story also stock picking is going to become extremely difficult because i think private capital formation is not easy to come by stocks will need to grow on their own steam or have enough equity to be able to as i keep saying uh, attract enough debt which is going to be difficult to come by as we move on so given all this my own assessment is it's a stock picker's market you got to be and you'll have industries where two or three stocks hit new highs and the others are going bankrupt i think that's going to be the way of the future so mm-hmm. consolidation those are the kind of themes that will prevail it's a lot going to be a lot more difficult to make money and we shouldn't be governed necessarily by two or three days index moves because at the end of the day foreign money follows foreign and overseas uh, you know allocations if there's a, if there's problems galore overseas i'm not sure if uh, you know we'll be bereft of indians uh, of money uh, i mean we'll be devoid of that particular phenomena which is money moving out of india so i think forgetting everything else we've got a great bottom in place as a result of uh, this mandate but the rest will have to be very very careful but i think the bigger takeaways for the country not so much for the markets speaking of money uh, jakes now what is your assessment of how severe this nbfc issue is because you know let's face it i mean we do have a fairly active regulator and if things were very very dire perhaps the rbi would have stepped in or at least they wouldn't have talked down the market by saying that uh, there is no perhaps apparent need for a, a credit line as such to the system at large i mean the indication there seems to be that this is a problem limited around four or five entities uh, and they themselves have had a role to play in the situation they find themselves in today so how should we view it and is it really a ticking time bomb right uh with due respect to what the regulator may have said or alluded to sometimes these words may be pulled out of context i personally uh very d- uh, respectfully differ with that assessment i believe the sector is today uh a ticking time bomb uh there are large companies in the sector which are facing credit crunch for a variety of reasons and there are even larger companies who are solvent who are who are facing a crisis in terms of accessing any amount of money so growth is really a challenge today because free flow of money from the banking system to this uh, space is not coming through i may want to add one point here which i think every regulator needs to address that when you lend through the nbfc system you are actually creating two kinds of reserves there is a capital reserve uh, there's a capital allocation at the at the end of the bank bank puts aside let's say 10 rupees for every time it lends to an nbfc of you know double a or above and they in turn the nbfc in turn puts aside another 12 or 15 rupees in terms of lending onwards so technically for the same sme asset which the nbfc is more competent to service recover etc etc there is 25 rupees of capital in the system that's available so to suddenly say that this sector there's no pro- problem when there is it's an open secret in the market that virtually every single nbfc uh, you know especially those with real estate and wholesale uh, uh, portfolios uh, 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 which they run every single nbfc is virtually down their shutters in terms of fresh disbursements and that's a serious commentary so i'm not sure whether the regulators are seeing it the same way but i think the time to step in is not today or tomorrow but it was day before yesterday if okay, uh, fair enough uh, so uh, you know okay we we spoke about the beaten down stocks some of the stocks which have value which which are doing well uh, do you think that comes at the expense of the tried and tested uh, bank nifty hdfc bank kotak bank uh, you think some money moves from here or uh, do they continue to move uh, do they still remain the market leaders while others also participate uh 
I don't want to put that as an as an index, but I think that the PSU banks, especially the top two, three, in fact, I think many of them, if there's a PSU bank index, I'm almost willing to bet that that would outperform a private bank index over the next five years. Okay, there is a PSU bank index, of course. Let's just pull that out. Uh, uh, but Jake's... Uh, I don't want to bore people on that. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's fair enough. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, some, some rally has already played out in PSU banks, uh, especially if you see SBI. Uh, that's already rallied quite a bit. Uh, uh, you you reckon there's 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 more, uh, especially in the uh, say the uh, second rank PSU banks, uh, the likes of the Canara Bank, Indian Bank. I know you won't talk about individual stocks, but uh, uh, from investments yeah. point of view, is no, is, is this still good bet? But let me react differently. Mm -hmm. I think the number one public sector bank in the country of uh, of the country, especially of our size and our distribution can have a market cap easily three times what this bank has over the next few years. And I think that itself should have a, uh, you know, effectively a cascading down impact in terms of valuations of other public sector banks. I think you've not seen the, uh, we've not been witness to the sort of, un, uh, I mean, if you went through three, four quarters of zero or limited provisions of the kind of profitability that can get thrown up by each of these banks and the cash that it can generate, I think will be quite an eye popper in my opinion. And therefore, PSU banks, without a shadow of doubt, may be the one clean index play which people can do. Uh, and you know whether it's moved from 240 to 350, not talking stocks or a, uh, you know the second in the in the pack has moved from 100 to 140. I think is not really that relevant. I think these are multi-year bull markets of the kind that we've had in private sector banks. Speaking and of especially because of one big factor. Other than everything else about NPAs, etc., I'll just finish this one point, Surabhi. The one factor that is there is most of them have raised enough capital and brought promoter holding down to the 50-55, 55-58% range. So the limited room for dilution of the promoter stake means that fresh issuance of equity will not keep happening. And I think that's a pretty positive that many of these banks will have to now grow based on their own uh, organic growth, as it were, and that's always very good news for equity holders. Uh, that's, that's an interesting point and a point well taken on PSU Bank's Jake's. Um, well, by the way, we are looking at a 200-point rally on the Nifty. It's been a big, big, fantastic Friday from the point of view of the bulls. So I'll make this my last question. Since we are looking at a stock market and are looking at a screen, Jake's, uh, if indeed, I mean, even if the government goes the Maslow's hierarchy way and just keeps doing whatever is right for this economy, starting with the grassroots levels, over the next, you know, at least 12 odd months, do you see substantially higher levels in this market? Or do you think the upside is more or less capped? We are close to it now. I think the base at about uh, uh, 10,800 to 11,200 range is a pretty solid base. And if you take a 15% range from there, maybe you reach something like 12 and a half to 12, 12,800 or 13,000. It could overshoot based on liquidity flows. But to my mind, what's not, you know, the adrenaline in Russia is not as a result of the nifty move as much as the impact it has on the broad market as a whole. And I think as, uh, you know, uh, Anuj started off the thing by saying, uh, you know, quite prescient at that, that, you know, we should be focusing on the mid-cap index. And similar indices is what we should be focusing on. So I think the story is elsewhere. The nifty is really a sentiment player, but if nifty were to hang around in the broad 11 to 12 and a half range, but the broad market moved. I don't think anybody is going to be upset about it. Okay, Jake. Uh, you know, I can tell you that's uh, some of the best 15 minutes that I've spent this week. Uh, you know, and uh, that uh, there's some it's some interesting bits that you've brought. Uh, you know, on the, why the market is cheering and uh, how this is going to be a bit of a game changer. The Maslow moment. Uh, that's something that I would go and study as well. Thanks a lot for your time, as always. Uh, it was good talking to you today. That's the view from NJ Kumar. Thank you. Likewise. Thank you. Let's do one thing now. Uh, we have some more uh, market opinions, some more market veterans. Uh, okay. Uh, before we do that, uh, let's uh, focus on some of the earnings which should hit the screen at any point. Uh, GSW Steel's number should come. That's, uh, that's above estimates. The profit number straight away is almost uh, 100 crores above the uh, estimated line. Though this was supposed to be a slightly subdued quarter for JSW Steel because uh, realizations have been on the lower side. 
prices have been falling in the export markets, even in the local markets as far as steel goes. So let's just see because what Nigel's numbers were telling us that on a sequential <coughs> basis, EBITDA per ton is going to fall largely on account of lower realizations. Okay, that's the consolidated revenue number. First glance, Anuj, on the top line and bottom line, that seems to be beat. Even EBITDA is not bad. I mean, uh, the EBITDA uh, number on those conservative estimates, uh, at least right now, it seems to be slightly better than expectations. Yeah, better than expectation. And I tell you something, uh, I think this number should lead to some kind of uh, uh, near term perhaps pop for GSW Steel because it's a stock which is corrected and it's now, you know, a bit of a clean cleaner domestic play, uh, Surabhi, as far mm -hmm. as steel stocks are concerned. Tata Steel, of course, has a lot of uncertainty with that Thiessen Group. Mm. Uh, uh, JSW Steel, that, uh, and if you just uh, see the, the, the stock of uh, JSW Steel, uh, ever since its index inclusion, it's a stock which has actually underperformed. And uh, uh, right now, this stock is trading at its 20 and its 50 day moving average as well. And from this highs, uh, I think it's corrected quite a bit. In fact, this month also, it's down about 6%. So this looks like a good set of number that we have from GSW Steel. Uh, that EBITDA number should again come up for you. Uh, and uh, uh, beating the estimate by about 100 crores, uh, I think will go down well. Uh, we should uh, get some thoughts from Nigel as well. Uh, or, uh, perhaps get some, some reaction, but uh, uh, the prime of the numbers look good. Oh, absolutely. Just to uh, recap on the uh, uh, EBITDA per ton, uh, we are looking at a figure of 9,900. Now, if it's anything which is slightly better than that, which could explain I mean, why the EBITDA itself is you know, quite strong, then perhaps that is something that the market will take with both hands. Uh, that is what we are expecting from JSW Steel. We'll try and get more details on that in just a moment. Let me see if the uh, press release opens, which can give us some more detail. Uh, that's not the case right now. So we don't have too many additional numbers. Uh, volume slightly lower, realization no, lower. Are higher than the estimate. I think, uh, 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 sort of be the, the mm -hmm. poll that we had. I think at least from that, uh, that number looks higher. So, I think right now taking all boxes, uh, uh, a bit of 44, 40 crores. Uh, we should uh, uh, get uh, Nigel as well. Okay. okay, I just allow me a moment. Let me see if I can find the volume number. In the no, it, it flashed on the screen, okay. Surabhi. It looked, it looked quite good compared to the pool. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, look, it's a good set of number that you have from JSW Steel. Uh, and, uh, for, you know, the guidance is also looking quite okay. FY20 guidance is also quite okay. And it's, again, it's a stock which is corrected a bit So over the last few uh, days. 4.17 so. versus 4.11 million tons mm. for the quarter gone by. So, a uh, shade above perhaps uh, estimates yeah. on, on the volumes. 4.17 million tons is what they've done. 4.11 mm. is what the poll number was. So I guess it's uh, uh, so far so good. That's what we have. Um, yeah, it is a 3% drop year on year in mm. volumes, uh, but that's not something that is unexpected. That is unexpected lines. Uh, the company's uh, okay sales realizations declined by 2% why on why. That's not bad because the drop in realizations was supposed to be a lot more sharper. Uh, so it's just a 2% decline in net sales realizations and that explains why there's an EBITDA beat coming through. Cost of key inputs like power and fuel were higher due to repeat depreciation and higher electro and refractory costs. Um, part of it which was low, offset by lower uh, cost on materials like iron ore and coal. So therefore, uh, it's, it's a blended mix. Some of the inputs mm -hmm. did go up like graphite electrodes, but the others were down. So net net, that EBITDA number seems to be a lot better than expectations. Okay, so that's GSW Steel. Suffice to say, good set of numbers that you have and the stock up about 5%. In fact, uh, it's now perhaps the top nifty gainer. If you take a look at the, the, the stocks and uh, volumes also quite, uh, quite big on GSW Steel at this point in time. Uh, Top gainer is ICICI Bank, but uh, JSW Steel is close there. Uh, uh, Lata is in conversation with some of the country's top fund managers. Let's uh, dip in for a bit. Why is it if money is not coming there, that is a trust issue, isn't it? How will that be resolved by liquidity? See, the fact is, you know, if you, at the bottom of any market, you will see problems. So if equity market was at 52-week low, you would have problems. So when you have the highest yield to maturity, you have huge margin of safety at this point of time. And uh, the question is that uh, you look at the one year returns of let's say a small cap fund or a mid cap fund and compare it with what you get in debt, all the debt funds have delivered. Mm. And uh, at least in ICSA Prudential, all the debt funds have delivered. So the challenge is that 
uh, I don't know what people are looking at because in, uh, in debt at this point of time because you're getting 10% yield to maturity. It's not that savings bank account gives you much lower, FDs give you much lower, the incremental return will carry some risk. So you are getting very good debt flows? We are not getting debt flows and I think there, if you want equity markets to deliver, I think you need to see this 10 coming down to 9 because end of the day you are getting a huge return on debt without taking equity risk today. Okay. And that is a sign that there is a huge margin of safety in debt mutual funds. Okay. In equity is fairly priced today. Okay. Uh, on the other hand, debt is very attractively okay. priced. So you are coming back to the real rate issue and the need for interest rates to come down. Now, you know, I have been audience to the analysis of this problem ad nauseum for the last 72 hours. Every expert on the channel has spoken about liquidity. Okay, we'll get you more from that panel in just a bit. But right now, let's go across to Nigel and understand how some of these JSW numbers seem to be above estimates. Nigel, your first take? Yeah, uh, you know, so dear, just looking at the numbers, it appears the consolidated EBITDA number is a little bit better than what we were working with. Mm -hmm. uh, we were working with a number of around 4,150 crores. I think it's somewhere around 4,400 crores approximately. So a couple of factors sort of, uh, you know, influence this one is that the EBITDA per ton on the domestic front, that's, mm. the compression is not as sharp as early expected. We were working with a compression of around 2,000 to around 2,500 rupees. So we'll wait by for the management because uh, in the press release, the EBITDA per ton number hasn't yet been given uh, to us. The sales volume numbers, if you can just help me with that number. The sales volume, Nigel, is 4.17 million tons. So that's along expected lines. You were expecting a 3% drop in volumes, right? Yeah, yeah. So this is a 4.17. This is at the higher end of what the Shido is working with. There were estimates even for a degrowth and for a number of around 4 million tons odd. So that's one of the factors that could have worked in their favor, which could mean that the EBITDA per ton number, the decline is not as much as expected. So the higher volumes on the domestic front is something that has helped. We'll have to wait by for management commentary in terms of what is mm. the calculated EBITDA per ton on the domestic uh, business. Second factor is that the U.S. business, the capacity utilization levels have been ramping up because of the tariffs that have been put on Chinese products. So that has helped them in terms of volume. But the EBITDA number for the U.S. business as well will be something that we are going to be looking at. They had done around $3 million in the previous quarter. And at best, they've done around $5 million. So that number as well will be quite crucial. Volumes will be higher. Realizations, though, are uh, lower uh, globally. So we'll have to see how that makes uh, you know, uh, goes by. Okay, Nigel, thanks a lot for that. Uh, we need to take a break. Uh, JSW Steel still uh, up, but has come off a you know, bit from the high point. Some profit taking, that's the trading move that happens, of course. Uh, uh, still up 4%. Uh,